Welcome back. My name is Gary, and I'm doing a series. I've done a series of videos on YouTube in this playlist uh, designed to help people on unguided tracking mounts and DSLR type equipment to uh, level up a little bit. One of the key things that we've used throughout this series is uh, Cyril, and I've written scripts and tried to expand the scripting ability of people in earlier videos. So throughout this video, I'm going to have to assume that you have some knowledge of Cyril, or it would just take forever, but all that information is further is available primarily in the third video of this series, Introducing Cyril. Anyway, so I was asked uh, via YouTube to do a video about uh, the manual workflow in Cyril, so starting with all your calibration frames, uh, working them into the light frames, uh, registering, stacking, all manually. So that's what today's um, series or episode is about. Now this is the eighth in a series that was intended to be six. And one of the reasons for that is I just keep finding cool new ways to use Cyril. For instance, this image here, I was just up in the mountains uh, a few days ago. And uh, my first starry landscape, so I just uh, took five 45 second exposures of the sky tracked and five 45 second exposures of the mountain untracked in pitch black. I didn't think there was even an image there, but uh, anyways, I've written a script in Cyril that can uh, stack the sky and generate a TIFF uh, to take out and then uh, stack the ground and export or produce a TIFF to take out of Cyril and then you can blend it in other software. So that's uh, kind of a cool usage. Again, uh, that will be the subject of a future video, but uh, like I say, I just keep finding new things. I've also used it when you, uh, for instance, for Orion, if you do a, a set of uh, longer, deeper exposures, you end up blowing out the cores. So you do a shorter set, or more than one even, and uh, you get a less blown core, or a good core, and then you blend them. And uh, I've also written a script in Ciro that will take those fully process images and align them with the registration function um, so that you're ready to do your blend in other software. And again, the subject of a future, uh, a future video. Now today, um, I'm going to be uh, uh, using some images that I took last night. I've got a full set of calibration frames. I shot darks last night for the first time this winter. And so we're going to go through the whole manual workflow, preparing the calibration frames, then using those calibration frames to pre-process the light frames. Um, we'll go through manual registration, manual stacking, and then because I haven't seen these images yet, they were just shot last night, I'm completely blind on this. I'm just going to do a quick pre-process uh, getting ready to stack, and we'll just kind of see what's there. Now my target for this, um, is based on the shootout between Trevor from Astro Backyard and Nico from Nebula Photos three weeks ago. Uh, they each took a DSLR and a kit lens and they shot the uh, Witchhead Nebula. So I've been waiting for a chance to replicate that. It's taken this long, but I did it last night, but not with a zoom lens. I just used a 135 prime. And uh, in that three weeks, of course, the days have gotten longer, and uh, Rigel, the whole constellation has moved downward in the sky, so I didn't have a wide shooting window. Um, it was light until 9 o'clock, too light until 9 o'clock, and then uh, by shortly after 10, the uh, constellation was down into the horizon kind of thing. So... Uh, I don't know what I, if I got which head or not. I looked at a couple of subs. There's kind of a faint outline there. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. So that's kind of what it's about. Now, in terms of uh, preparation, I have my Cyril current project folder here. And when you use scripts, you have a folder called biases where you put your bias frames, a folder called darks for your dark frames, flats for your flat frame, and lights for your light frames. And I have just done exactly that to keep it all organized. But when you do it manually, you can load frames from anywhere on your computer. It really doesn't matter. But uh, I thought for the sake of simplicity, it would be best just to use the, uh, the normal um, <clears throat> 
the normal way of doing things. So, so in the uh, biases, I've got uh, biases, and the, this whole project is at ISO 400. So these biases were shot at ISO 400. The darks precisely match my lights. They're uh, one minute ten seconds ISO 400 f 5.6. Now this uh, 135 lens I have is minimum minimum f 3.5. So I stopped down two, and that was done for sharpness. Um, uh, I'm trying to avoid chromatic aberration and trying to avoid blowing out the brighter stars with such a long exposure. So again, it's experimental. We'll see where we're at. In terms of flats, I just shot a few flats here. I usually use a master flat I prepared a long time ago, um, but we're doing the whole thing manually here, so these are just raw flat frames. And then in here we have um, 60 uh, 70 second images uh, of the area just to the right or to the east, I guess, of Rigel, which is where the Witch Head Nebula resides. So that's the uh, preparation. Now, if we're going to go into Cero, uh, normally I could do this just by hitting this OSC pre-processing script, and it would do it all automatically, but I've had a request to go through the manual procedure. Now, Cero has actually published uh, on their website resources a, a video kind of similar to this, but it's uh, a little bit difficult to follow, and uh, I had to do further research to clarify a few points. So I think it's a good idea to just work our way all the way through it. Now, the first thing we need to do is convert the camera raw frames into FIT files. And something else happens to here as well. As soon as you do a conversion of a group of files, it creates a sequence. And uh, sequences are the basis of the rest of this workflow. So even if your camera takes FIT files, you'd still need to go through this conversion process. In that case, though, you can click on Symbolic Link down here at the bottom. Um, if you already have taken FIT files, if Cyril can work with them, I don't have a camera like that, but I'm assuming it will create a Symbolic Link rather than copying those files. Um, in my case, I've got camera raw files, so it has to convert them and create new FIT files. So there's no symbolic links in that process. If you were just had light frames, you could debayer at this point too. Um, but we have calibration frames, and calibration frames have to be done before debayering. So we do not select debayer at this point. So what I'm going to do, uh, we're going to do our biases first because they're kind of at the basis of everything. So I'm just going to select all of them and hit Add. OK, so that, there we go. And now it needs a sequence name. So I'm just going to call this BIAS bias. And I'm also going to move Cero into the process folder. I don't want all of these ancillary files to be generated in the Cero main folder. So before we do anything, I'm going to go CD space process. And you can see up here that uh, we are in the process folder now. So as a result, no matter where I open these from, the converted files will show up in the process folder, which is where Cero is right now. So I'm going to hit convert. <laughs> and. Uh, Execution time, 2.23 seconds. Now we go over here to the Sequence tab, and we have this bias sequence. Remember I gave it the name bias? And uh, so there's a sequence, and there's a frame list available of all of the biases. So at this point, we don't need to pre-process them. Uh, we pre-process other frames with biases, but biases don't need to be pre-processed. They don't need to be registered. So we can, the sequence is loaded, we can move straight on to stacking. <clears throat> now with most of the um, calibration frames, you would use median stacking and no normalization. That's kind of important at this point. And then down here, it's going to stack and then produce a file, file called bias stacked.fit. I could change that file name, but I'm going to leave it alone because if I was, um, if I didn't already have a stack bias that I could use in the future uh, without going through this again, 
then I could just save this off onto the hard drive somewhere and reuse it in the future, which is the subject of prior videos. So I'm going to hit start stacking. I don't know if the uh, screen capture software will keep running smoothly throughout this, but let's give it a try. Okay, so now if we look, we should have in this process folder our biases and our stack bias. So we can leave that one behind. Next stage is to prepare, I guess, we, okay, we're going to get rid of that and start again. So this time, let's do our darks. So we'll go up to the darks folder, select all of those, add, and everything is the same here, except I'm going to name this sequence dark and hit convert. Okay, that is done. So if we go to the sequence tab and search sequences, now we have two of them. So we'll make sure that the dark sequence is loaded up and we shall go over to the stacking tab. Same thing, median no normalization. Now, there's another option that you can pre-process the darks with bias. They call that optimized darks, um, which just adds a couple of extra steps, and I'm not certain that there's any advantage. So I'm just going to go with straight uh, darks. And this one is going to be dark stacked dot fit. And again, I think I'll save that. I know if I'm using, uh, I'll be using the same camera and uh, often shooting in the same temperature. Last night it was minus two to four centigrade. I'm going out again tonight. It will be the same. So I can just save later this file off and use it um, and use it in my uh, processing of tonight's image, images. So we're just going to uh, start stacking. Less than one second runtime. So if we go back to sequences, now we have, sorry, we have our two sequences. Now the next one to do is our flats. So the first thing we'll do is erase those and we will add and we will go to um, the flats. And add them. So the first thing we're going to do is convert them, but then we are also going to, after that, pre-process them with the biases. I'll talk in a minute about uh, calibration math, uh, but uh, anyways, we're going to convert this and we're just going to call this sequence flat and hit convert. There we are. And now we'll go back to, okay, the flat sequence is loaded. Now we need to go to pre-processing. And what we want to do is use offset, which is bias. Uh, we want to, um, and then we're going to select our stacked bias file as the source for that. Um, we're not going to use darks, or, well, of course, not flats in here. That comes with other files. Um, enable cosmetic correction. These boxes are all dead. That's something that you use if you use darks. That lights up that section. But, uh, so it's irrelevant whether those are checked or not. They're not in use right now. So this is going to be uh, a new sequence, pre-processed. And since we're working on the flats, it will be pre-processed flat. Uh, sequence. So we're going to go start pre-processing. Okay, if we go back to search sequences, now we have four of them. There's our pre-process flat. We don't need to register it. We are going to go straight to stacking. And we are going to use, again, median stacking, but this time with multiplicative normalization. Uh, generally, that's what you do if you're pre-processing one uh, calibration frame with another. According to Cyril, there's another option to go to uh, um, 
a Windsor Eyes Sigma clipping of some kind. But again, the, the typical way to do this is medium with multiplicative. And this will come out as pre-processed flat stack. Okay, stacking is complete, six seconds. So if we go into our process folder, you see we've got all these files we've generated now, and there's our pre-processed pre flat. Now, I wanted to just show you calibration math a little bit. Um, this is something that I've discussed in a prior video. That's where this graphic came from. Now, if you have darks, the math is light minus dark divided by flat minus bias. And so if you don't have darks, it's light minus bias divided by flat minus bias. So we've already done the flat minus bias. We did flat pre-processed with bias. So that is ready to go. The next thing is we're going to convert the lights, and we have to pre-process them either with darks or with bias. So we will continue. So our calibration frames are ready to go. So we're going to go back to conversion now. We're going to clear this, hit the plus, and this time we're going to go to the lights. Scroll to the bottom. This is a fairly long list. And hit add. I'm just going to add all of them. I haven't really inspected these, but I'm going to let um, Cyril register them, and it also gives you a grading on them at that point. That's the time to go through and see if there's anything that you don't want to use. So we are going to rename this sequence light. And same, everything is good, no debayering, and just hit convert. Okay, let's just have a quick look at one of those. This is an auto stretch of a, of a single frame. Um, and it's still not be, be debared, so it's a single layer frame, uh, black and white. It hasn't been split into the color channels yet. And the uh, nebula should be right along here, and I can see a faint outline of it. This is a very faint nebula, and I was shoot, shooting, like I say, lower into the horizon last night. Even though it was an exceptionally clear night and good seeing, good uh, um, typical um, clarity, uh, kind of a good night for shooting. So we'll see how that works out. Okay, so now in sequences, we've got our light sequence, which is loaded. Now we need to pre-process our light frames. Now, if you don't have darks, you would use offset. Um, and you would use the master offset that we prepared earlier, or the bias stacked. Okay. If you're not using darks, you wouldn't check darks. And if you're using flat, you would use that uh, pre-processed master flat that we made. There we go. Now, in this case, I'm ready to start pre-processing, assuming there's no darks. But in this case, we have darks. Now, we do not use bias here, because lights and darks have bias. So when you do the subtraction here, if you use dark, when you do the subtraction, you're subtracting out the bias as well. Um, so this is kind of an either-or. If you don't have darks, you use the offset. You go light minus bias. But if you do have darks, you go light minus dark, and then it's divided by flat minus bias, and this master flat already had the bias subtracted out of it. Now, this equalized CFA, um, this is something, color filter array. Um, I used a DSLR camera, so obviously it has a color filter array. And this is a black and white one-layer image. But Cyril needs to know if it's a mono uh, sensor or a color sensor. So we're going to hit equalize CFA because it's a color sensor. Now using darks, oh, this fix X trans, that's for certain Fuji cameras, uh, get a rectangular uh, uh, distortion in the middle of the picture because of their autofocus sensors. 
And so if you have one of those X-Trans Fuji cameras, you can fix it right here. Um, okay, uh, we're using dark. So enable cosmetic correction. Yes, we can do that here because the dark should reveal any hot and cold pixels. So there's hot and cold sigma. They're just at default, so I'm going to use them. Again, the CFA here um, um, has to do with the fact that all the images that we're using so far are not the Bayard. They're all black and white. So it needs to know if it's dealing with a color filter array image or if it's dealing with a mono uh, processor image. So in my case, the SLR, I'm going to check CFA. And then they have this estimate cold and hot. I'm just going to hit that. Oh, error. Okay. Oh, that's because I've got a light uh, image um, loaded instead of a dark image, so we are not going to worry about this. Okay, now also, after pre-processing, we can debare. Uh, saves a step. Uh, it'll pre-process them and debare the lights. And uh, I believe that we are ready to go. So this is going to come out as pre pp underscore light dot sequence. This is going to be uh, 60 new light images uh, pre-processed this time. And those are the ones that we're going to stack. So we are ready. I think what I'm going to do is pause this video uh, because the uh, process will use all the processor I have, and I'm not sure that the uh, screen capture software can keep up with us. So I'm just going to pause this for a moment, and uh, I'll be back when this is done. All we have to do is hit Start Pre-Processing. Hi, this is uh, being added after the fact. Uh, if you go back a very short distance, you'll see that I forgot to select my master dark frame. And uh, so I'm not going to refilm the entire remainder of the video, but uh, the result was a little less than it could have been if I had actually done that. It's one of the reasons I use scripts. You don't forget things like that. So at the end of the video, I'll come in and uh, give you a a look at uh, what we produced uh, compared to what I was able to produce uh, after doing it properly. Thank you. Okay, that is done now. It did not take very long, uh, 38 seconds only. Um, that's just the pre-processing of the registration and the stacking will take a little bit longer than that. There is one thing I forgot to, uh, to mention uh, in the pre-processing of the lights. We have this option here, optimization, when you're using darks. Now, I mentioned earlier that you could pre-process the darks with the bias. And if you had done that, you can click this. You would then you would use offset, dark, and flat. Um, and you would select this if you had pre-processed the darks. But there's a warning here. Do not apply dark optimization if the bias has not been subtracted previously. We didn't do that. so. Um, I did it correctly. That was not checked when we did this a couple of minutes ago. But um, that's what that is about. So if you follow this workflow where you just stack your darks and subtract them from the lights, you do not select that one. Okay, so we have our pre-processed light sequence loaded right now. Um, and that is ready to go. If we open a frame list, um, there they are, all 60 of them, and we can just click on any of these to uh, um, <clears throat> have a look at them. And the other thing is that they have now been debared, so we have a red, green, and a blue channel. The RGB is a color image, and it's green, because at this point there's been two green pixels in your sensor for every red and blue one. And it's easily removed later after stacking, so that's nothing to be concerned about. But uh, this is just looking at one frame. And I'm just going to put this in extreme stretch view. You know, the Witch Head Nebula is kind of there. I'm hoping that improves a little bit with stacking. But we'll just have to wait and see about that. The one thing about the RGB window is it's synthetic and serial. Talked about this in prior videos. You can't do anything. It's only for visualization. If you actually want to do anything that involves selecting or anything else, you have to be in one of the individual color channels because those are actual layers in the image. Synthetic window, not much you can do. 
Okay, I'm just going to type close to free up that much memory. And so again, we'll double check. Uh, sequence, we are going to go to our pre-processed light sequence. Next stage is registration. Uh, we're going to use global star alignment. Uh, the green channel, because of the extra, because there's two um, green pixels for every red and blue, is usually the one with the least noise. So it's going to use the green channel. You can change that if you wish, but it's going to use the green channel by default uh, for uh, registering and evaluating um, um, each of the images. Now we've got a bit of a problem here with uh, these tooltips getting in the way. Just make sure we, have, yes, we're still, okay, registration. Okay, uh, prefix will be R, and we're working on the PP light sequence, so our new sequence, uh, there'll be 60 more FIT files generated. Um, and those are the ones that we will stack, um, but they will be registered. So there's a few other options here. We could match stars in selections, so we'd make a selection and click that um, to limit the selection, but we're just going to use the whole image for registering. So I think we are ready to go. I'm going to hit go register. I will try to leave the uh, video running, but if it breaks up because the computer is too busy with this. Uh, I'll just edit that out later. So now it's identified the stars in the image. These orange orange dots are identifying uh, locations that it will use to align. And down here, there's a progress bar to show you how it's. Uh, Getting along, we're about a quarter done right now. Okay, registration is complete. It is reporting that two failed 58 are registered. So there's just two that have disappeared. And uh, um, I could scroll back up in the list here and find out which ones have a look at them if I wanted to. But uh, I'm just going to trust that that kind of was okay. So now in the sequences, we have our registered pre-processed lights loaded. So from here, we can go to plot. And this gives us an idea of the quality of the images. So higher is worse in this case. So we've actually got, based on my prior experience, pretty good, pretty good average quality here. I think it's because I shot with a shorter lens and two stops down from wide open. Uh, everything's just sharper and uh, less aggressive ISO as well, which helps with uh, not blowing out stars and chromatic aberration and all that kind of stuff. So I am going to pop open a uh, frame list. This is the RPPP light frame, and our reference frame is selected and showing here. We can view any of them. Now, I'm going to switch over to the green channel. Or these tooltips are really kind of problematic. <laughs> I haven't run into this before. I don't know why the tooltips are being so trouble troublesome. Now let's try it this way. 
Seems to be stuck on red. Okay, I guess we're going to have to do some editing out here. Okay, this is a new version of Searle, and I haven't run into this before, but I think this might be a new bug of some kind. There we go. Okay. I had to use my mouse wheel to scroll that uh, because the tooltip is really determined to be in the way. Okay, now we're just going to click on this and sort it by the quality measures. So frame 31 was the one it didn't like. So let's have a look at this. Now there are uh, stacking artifacts because these images have been aligned. And uh, okay, I can see what's going on here. There's uh, quite a bit of star trailing. Even the uh, big stars or bigger stars are kind of oblong. Um, let's go to the second worst. Okay, that's not so good. That's image four. Okay, let's reverse this now and look at one of the better ones. See, much, much better. So we're just trying to get an idea. Okay, those are starting to get oblong. Okay, so 3.7. Okay, I'm going to go back to, okay, right here at 3.9. The star trailing is not too bad, so I think I'll make that as a cutoff on our filtering later. One of the uh, new things you can do in Cyril is click on one of these high points and go exclude frame 31, exclude frame 4. So you can take out your worst ones that way. Um, anyway, so that's what we can do in the plot uh, tab. Now I'm going to go to the stacking tab. Holy cow. This time we're going to go to average stacking with rejection. Okay, this tooltip thing is really quite bad. I am going to close Searle and reopen it. Uh, just see if we can make that improve. Okay, we're still in the process folder. We're going to search our sequences. Go to the registered pre-processed. Over to stacking. And those ones we took out of there are still gone. So. Okay, average stacking with rejection, additive with scaling. We don't need to recompute, and we do not want to do output normalization on these ones. For pixel rejection, I've been using linear fit clipping. Um, there's also median sigma, Windsor rise sigma. Um, linear fit is more modern. It was written by uh, the developer of PixInsight, and it's been working for me, so I just take it with the... Uh, with the default uh, high and low values of 5. And at this moment, we're stacking 58 of the 58 in the sequence. So we'll go selected. That took it down to 54 because we unselected some of them on the plot stack. I'm going to add a second filter. And this time, we're going to go with uh, FWHM. 3.99. I think I decided 3.9 was going to be kind of my cutoff point. Uh, and at that point, we're stacking 49 of the 58. And this is going to come out as registered pre processed light stacked. And so I'm just going to add in there a dot dot slash, which will cause that file to be put into Cyril's main directory, because right now we're still in the process directory. And I'm going to hit start stacking. And I think I do have to pause the video for this uh, part. Um, because it's very processor intensive. So we shall do that. OK, Cyril has finished that now. It only took a minute and 35 seconds on my machine. Um, and it has loaded up the stacked image. I'm just going to have a quick auto stretch here. But first thing I want to do, because we are still in the process folder, is go down to the command line, cd space dot dot. We'll tell Cyril to move up one directory. 
So now we're in the main directory and we want to op reopen this file uh, because we changed where we're looking at it from. So let's go to an auto stretch. And you can, again, the green is there just inevitable uh, with the way this works and with the debayering algorithm they use. They choose one that is optimized for preserving the roundness and sharpness of stars. And uh, if you use any of the other debayering algorithms, uh, you can get an actual color straight out of it. But I choose to uh, live with this and just make a quick adjustment uh, shortly into pre-processing. Anyways, I can see a little bit of the nebula there. I'm going to go to an extreme stretch view. Now, the histogram view does two things. It, it's an extreme stretch, and there's the witch head. I kind of missed my target here. He's too low in the frame because there is stuff down below here. Um, but I also see a problem with my flat file, which is quite old now. So I, I'm going to have to reshoot that flat. And I see a gradient. So I think I will take this through just for curiosity with you to, to basic pre-processing where we can have an idea of what's there. So I'm going to go back to auto stretch. And the first thing that we need to do, and I cannot be in the RGB to do any kind of selecting. I'm going to take the green because we can see the stacking artifacts. And I'm going to make a selection. I'm going to go to a three to two ratio just to kind of keep it the same as the camera. And if you're trying to keep as much as you possibly can in the image, you know, you can take it up as big as you want, but you do want to cut out the stacking artifacts at this point. You know what, there's some kind of cool stuff up here. I think I'll kind of do it like this and we'll see what we end up with. Um, with this 5534, I'm just going to cut that down with making a nice round number, 5502. Right click, crop. Okay, no more stacking artifacts. Next thing I'm going to do is selection free ratio because in the next stages we don't want to be locked into that 3 to 2 ratio. So the first thing we want to do is a background extraction. And that's an image processing. Uh, this is something designed to deal with gradients. So I'm going to put it back in the histogram view. This, is, this part has all been covered in early, earlier, earlier videos, so we're just going to do this. Um, can't see all the dots. Yeah, I don't really want any of those green dots on the nebula. So we right click to remove them and then you can place dots with a left click. And there's some stuff down below here. We might pick up some faint red. This is not a modded camera. Okay, I'm just going to give this a try. We'll hit apply. That is done. Let's go back to the auto stretch view. Close this. I'm sorry, go back to the histogram view. And I can undo up here and redo. Now this is pretty huge because if you don't have background extraction, when you start stretching this image, you're going to have these gradients that are really, really tough to deal with. So this is one of the more advanced features of Searle that I consider absolutely necessary for this kind of shooting. Um, so we're in a much better place here now. Now the next thing we're going to do is a color calibration, which will help deal with the green. There's a few options here. We can go remove green noise and just take the default. And now it's come up blue. So I'm going to close that and undo it. Try to... Okay, I think I'll take the blue channel for this. We want to select a black area of the sky. Let's stay right away from Rigel, the star Rigel. 
and a tiny little bit of white is okay, but you don't want to get a big chunk of a star. Okay, so we're going to go to color calibration. And at this point, we will use current selection, background neutralization. Now we've given it a black point, which helps with colors. And it also helps with uh, white pollution. It kind of does a subtraction down to black. So this is, again, getting us in a much better position to start stretching. Now, that's not everything, though. There's also a white involved here. And you don't want necessarily pure white, but if you have a white nebula or a bright white star like this, you want a, a good sampling of white in there. Let's use current selection. We'll go to RGB and all the way back. Now we'll try removing green noise. Okay, this is getting better. So those are two of the ways to get to an image to start stretching, and there's other stuff we can do here, but obviously here in the auto stretch view, we've got a, we've got a nebula. And uh, later on in post-processing after we stretch, um, I can do a lot to bring that out. I think this image is going to turn out okay. There's something down over here too. So the next thing I want to do just for fun is photometric color calibration. Just I have to type, give it something that's in the image, so I'm just going to go Rigel and then click on it to load up its sky coordinates and then give it information about the lens. It's a 200 millimeter lens and my pixel size is 3.92. So what this will do is actually assign, oh, plate solving, plate solving, plate solving failed. That is a surprise. Oh, sorry, I was on my 135 lens. I'm so used to 200, it just becomes automatic. Now we've got something going on. And I am going to run that a second time. It only applied color to 25 stars. And it also does something with the background. So that's another way to get rid of that green automatically, but we're trying to demonstrate different ways to use this. Okay, this time it did 100 stars and gave a background reference. And now since we've plate solved, we can also overlay stuff that's in there. Uh, there's a new button, a new, new ver version of Searle down here that you can turn on this overlay and turn it off. Um, so I might just grab a snapshot of this, which is now in Searle's home directory. It's a reduced size PNG file. Um, that if I wanted to post, you know, with the real image, I could post this alongside it to give kind of a sky map. So we're going to turn that off. Okay, there's other things that we could do. Um, wavelets, I would rather do that in a raw editor, like uh, Darktable, or, or uh, there's certain parts of uh, Lightroom, for instance, that do wavelets. Um, cosmetic correction. If we didn't have dark frames, you can ask Searle to detect automatically hot and cold frames. So I'm just going to run that because we did use darks this time. Say 423 hot frames corrected. Um, without the darks, it would have been a couple of thousand. So the darks did most of their job there. So I'm going to close that and leave it. Now this crop is uh, set, and I think I'm going to, there's lots of nebulosity in here, there's stuff around, so I think I'm just going to keep this framing, and so I'm going to hit save. That's now saved our registered pre-processed stacked uh, file, the fit file, so if I ever have to come back and restretch or do anything else with the linear data, this remember this is not stretched yet, it's still linear. Um, I've got this as a starting point now, so that will be saved away with the rest of the files from this project, and uh, and uh, it can be come back, it can be returned to. Okay, so the next thing is to start stretching. Um, I'm going to do part of it in in Cyril, and then I think I'll reserve the rest uh, for post-processing afterwards. 
Uh, part of the reason for that is that if you're mostly stretched in Suro and then go over to GIMP or Photoshop, you can actually make a mask to protect the brightest parts of the image. I do that with Orion. Um, and then that way, when you continue stretching, uh, the brightest parts don't blow out quite as much. It doesn't help if they're already blown, but if they're on the verge, you can protect them while you finish your stretching. Uh, that'll be the subject of another uh, video in the future. So I'm just going to make sure there's nothing else here I want to do. Okay, we're going to go to an arc sign. I want to bring out that white nebula. So this is a color, color preserving technique. Something under 100, we're still very black, so we do not need to apply any black compensation. Okay, now it's coming up. I don't want to clip any black, so I think we'll just leave it like that. And this brings out the star colors really nicely, too. I'll give it a little bit more arc spine, and then we'll switch over to histogram stretching. Okay, and down here we got a shortcut, shortcut for histogram stretching. So we'll work on that a little bit. I, they have a nuclear button here on the histogram where it'll auto stretch. I'm not a fan. It's a little bit too harsh for me. Uh, so I'm going to just work it up a little bit at a time manually. And if you look at this histogram, because of the color calibration we did, the red, green, and blue channels are perfectly aligned now. Uh, so when we go off into other software, that's very, very helpful. I'm going to hit apply there and then go auto. Okay, we're, we're pretty close now. I think I'm going to export it like this. Um, and then I can finish it off. In my case, it'll be in GIMP. Uh, that's not the subject of this video. Let me just give it a little bit more arc sign, and we'll see what we can bring out of that. separating our black. Now the stars are too colorful now, so I probably should have finished this with histogram stretching. And it's not fully stretched yet, but a uh, little bit of chromatic aberration. That's better than if I had shot one stop down. And it looks like I got enough light to have something on the uh, Witch Head Nebula. It's very faint. It was close to the horizon. So I'm pleased with this and uh, almost a little surprised that uh, that it uh, worked out this well. So at this point, I can just go up here and export it as a 32-bit TIFF. Just uh, rename the file extension. Save 32. I'm working in GIMP, so I can leave it in 32. If you're in anything Adobe, you want to switch it here to 16-bit um, because you can't do much in Photoshop in 32-bit. And I will hit save, and that is now in Searle's home directory. Now, I did not hit this save, which means the fit file that this is based on is still not stretched. And I'm going to leave it like that in case I want to work on this or change its, uh, change its stretching. So let's go look in that folder. There's our um, PNG. That was, the, uh, that was the one that I exported. So there's references here if you want to look stuff up and see what's there. Uh, this, of course, is the star Rigel. And we have a TIFF here in 32 bits, so it's not going to display very well in the windows. But if I open it up with GIMP, that is my starting point, and it's not bad. Um, you know, a couple of quick adjustments. I'm going to change this to RGB. Okay. 
this is not a for real project. I'm just making sure nothing's blown out. I'm going to drop a sample. 218 out of 255. Uh, so nothing is blown up or even close to being blown out. So I'm good to go for further stretching later. Anyways, I think we will finish this uh, video at this point. Um, like I say, I was asked to work through the whole manual process. If you had gone within Suro with all those calibration flame frames placed in exactly the same place and gone to scripts and run this one, OSC, one shot color pre-processing, would have done exactly the same thing in about two minutes total. But uh, by working through it, you see how it works and you see different tangents you can take along the way. So it's, uh, I think, not a wasted endeavor. Okay, um, as I mentioned partway through the video, I made a mistake while I was preparing the darks. I, I never used them to calibrate the lights, simply for, forgot to uh, select the uh, master dark that we had prepared. So I wanted to uh, show you the results of that. Um, what we did in the video uh, produced this straight out of Cyril, and uh, it's not bad. Uh, this is stretched and then just exported as a JPEG. I did it again. This is also straight out of Cyril, a uh, different crop. I had to redo everything. But uh, it's a better look and feel to it. Um, still a lot of noise in there, but with a little bit of processing. I just did a little bit of processing, a noise reduction, color contrasting. And uh, that's pretty much my finished product there. Um, so, like I say, if you are going to do this manually, uh, double check every tab. In this case, in the pre-processing tab, I made a little bit of an error. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, it's uh, been my pleasure. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again. Thank you.